Deepak, you and I were both trained in science, biological sciences, and we respect science. Um, but the question of its, of its limitations is a controversial one. Uh, many of my science friends would say that science certainly has limitations, but if we exceed those limitations, we're in the realm of opinion, not truth. So question is, what are the limits of science, and is there any real truth beyond science? Well, first of all, science is enormously successful. We're both here because we came in a jet plane, okay, which is uh, the production of scientific effort, right? Everything we do is today based on science, whether you use the internet or call somebody on the cell phone or this air conditioning. So let's not deny that science is amazingly successful enterprise. Does it give us um, any idea of what fundamental truth might be? Is there something called fundamental truth? Here's my take on it. You know, when we say empirical fact, which is the basis of all science, right? I want empirical facts. Repeatability. Repeatability. Empirical. What we are recording, though, is a species-specific mode of observation. Even though we don't know, understand the hard, know the answer to the hard question, uh, we know that the brain has something to do with it. So your brain is the observation deck for the universe in a way to see itself. Right. Without that brain, you wouldn't right. have the experience. Right. Right. We don't know how that happens, right. but we wouldn't have it. So brain and cosmos are complementarities in this, in a sense. You can't have cosmos or experience of cosmos with brain, without brain. Without brain. Okay, but now I don't know if you know about this mathematician, Alfred Korzybski, who basically said he was an Hunga American Hungarian mathematician. He said, by the time information gets to your brain, there are at least five levels of what he called abstraction. So there's first a photon, it hits the retina, sure, and sure. creates chemicals, whatever. So by the time it's all gets there, it's been edited many times. And different levels in the brain, as we know, from the periphery to the so midbrain. So how do you know what's brain. truth? Okay, if it is already abstracted, okay, number uh, uh, one. It's, it's a valid point. But you do, we do know this, there is consistency. So this, we, the, the science that we have has consistency, how the, how the sun works, how stars work, how galaxies form. We have things that are not inconsistent. So that's an independent verification of that what we're seeing is reality. Is it? Because if there was no consciousness, what would that perceptual experience be? By definition, there wouldn't be one, right? Okay, so fun, fun, what we are asking a very deeper question. Is there a fundamental reality that with mathematical precision creates the galaxies and stars and the brain at the same time? Okay, because you need both, right? And then that universe that we're experiencing is a human universe. Yes. Okay, because a bat's brain would navigate through the echo of ultrasound. A chameleon's eyeballs so will on two different axes. You can't even remotely imagine what this room looks like to a chameleon. You know, there are But snakes. it's not a different universe to a chameleon or to a bat. Than it's what a different experience of the It's universe. a different experience. That's all we have, experience, and we don't have a theory for experience. What is fundamental truth is a bigger question. Okay. <clears throat> It's kind of mind-boggling, isn't it, that you needed the constants to be precisely what they were. Yes. You needed cosmic inflation to start at 10 to the power of minus 37 and then suddenly slow down at 10 to the power of minus uh, 33 or 34. Uh, you needed, uh, preceding that, a Planck epoch where the laws of nature actually, as we know them, didn't exist. Okay, and they suddenly show up. It's kind of very... But what you're defining are the results of science. You could not have used any of the things you've talked about if it weren't for science. So the question I never is... Denigrated the question the is, value of science. Can, can any... And, and what you're saying may or may not be absolutely true. There seems to be a lot of independent confirming evidence for it to get more and more likely. Uh, things that are more in our, our uh, local environment, we would have more confidence in. But even such extreme things we have high confidence in today. The question is, if we go beyond science, can we ever have that same kind of confidence? 
No, the universe that science is discovering us for us is the human universe, okay? We do not know how we experience that universe. That's the fundamental uh, agreement for everyone, I think, agrees that despite the precision and accuracy that we have in describing this human experience, it's a human experience yeah. that science gives us of the universe, we don't know the consciousness in which those experiments are conceived. We're presuming the existence of consciousness before we even start to do the experiment. Yes, and, and the assumption is, is that over time as our science increases, just as we're able to discern the origin of the universe at 10 to the minus 36 seconds, which is incredible, a trillion, 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 trillionth of a second, if, if you're able to do that, Ultimately, you'll be able to explain how the brain uh, uh, creates consciousness. It's not science that does that. It's consciousness that does that. You know, it's consciousness that measures that. I mean, that's a nice thing to say, but how could I have confidence? Who measures? In? Who's come up with... It, it, with it, there is some circularity in, okay. in what I'm saying. Who came that's up correct. with the theory of cosmic inflation? Or, you know, eternal inflation or whatever. It had to be a consciousness expressing itself through what people say is an epiphenomenon. Wow, that's very interesting <laughs> that an epiphenomenon is describing the phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, but so if, if I would go with you, which, you know, I would be tempted to do, and believe in the fundamental nature of, of consciousness, can you ever get science to confirm it. <laughs> you'd, have a diff you'd need a different science. You'd need a science that goes beyond the subject-object split. So we're getting there in a way, you know, when people talk about quantum entanglement, quantum superpositions, they talk about non-locality, talk about the curvature of space and time. None of these things is imaginable, by the way, okay? Imagine the curvature of space-time. How does the space-time curve? I don't even know where the space-time is, okay? So imagine non-locality. I think our perceptual experience, and this is not a term I've coined, but I work with uh, physicists, Menas, you know, we have lots of collaborative work together right now, and uh, we're writing together. He uses a term called veiled non-locality and cosmic censorship. So, veiled non-locality, because we are having the experience of space-time and separation and the stars and the galaxies, infinite space, curvature of space-time, whatever that is, it looks a certain way, but it is actually another way, okay? That is cosmic censorship. That is veiled non-locality. The experience of uh, life is a local experience, right? In space and time. I was born, I go through these transformations, I die. These are space-time events. Where do they occur? Okay. And firstly, are they a, an illusion? Are they a veil of something that is beyond the subject-object split? Science is based on the subject-object split. I am the subject and that's the object, right? right? You start with the wrong premise because nature is one. Okay. Yet, it's a very successful enterprise, but because it's based on the subject of the split, you have climate change and global warming, you have eco-destruction, you have mechanized death, you have antibiotics in your food, you have petroleum products in your insecticides and pesticides. If this world ever becomes extinct, not only the human species, but this planet goes back to nothingness, it'll be because the human experiment will have failed, okay? And it has, will have failed because we created a science that was based on subject-object split. If we were truly great scientists, and that might come now with all these terminologies that I'm hearing, then our science would be holistic, it would be holy, it would be whole, it would be all-inclusive, it would not take the realm of subjectivity, where I experience poetry and art and music, where I ask these fundamental questions. Who am I? 
uh, well, what am I doing here? What's the meaning of my life? Uh, does God exist? Do I have a soul? What's the meaning of death? You think a neural network is processing that? It may be processing that, but it's certainly not coming up with those questions. How does a mechanical network come up with those questions? 